we, we sometimes or we often quote Jeremiah 17 9. What does that say about our heart? Yeah. And uh, the end of that verse says, who can know it? And then we stop there, and we don't always go on to verse 10, which gives us the answer. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of, of his doings. And he does that with his, his word, quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It get, gets in there. Uh, that's uh, Hebrews 4.12. And then the next verse says, all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so, uh, we're somewhat familiar with that, God's omniscient, and that uh, omniscience applies to what he knows about you and I. On the one hand, again, uh, holy, holy, holy God, knowing everything about me is a little bit terrifying. On the other hand, when I just don't feel like anyone understands what I'm going through, then, then it's like, oh, but the Lord knows, because he knows everything about me. How about man? Mankind. Man knows not all about you, because he can't see inside of you, but man knows much about you. And perhaps tonight we'd acknowledge mankind, fellow man, knows more about us than we'd like to admit or we'd like to think about. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, is uh, you'd be familiar with um, the Lord picking another king, first one, not so good. Messed up. The Lord goes to pick another king, going through David's family, the house of Jesse, and you get to the point of, well, it should be this one, and it couldn't be that one. And uh, we sometimes, well, we, we read it as it is in the scripture, man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Interesting if you flip that around. The Lord looketh on the heart, but man looketh on the outward appearance. That's what he can see, for better or, or for worse. Uh, what did Paul know about Timothy when he invited him to come on his evangelistic uh, team? I believe it would be the, ugh, get myself in trouble here. Not the first evangelistic journey, but uh, after that, maybe the second. Uh, Paul, Paul knew about Timothy, Acts chapter 16, verse 2, says that Timothy was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. So Paul knew from those that knew Timothy from those uh, two nearby towns. And I, again, I can't remember, uh, I believe Timothy was from Lystra and Iconium was nearby or, or vice versa. So Paul knew as he was, of course, being led of the Holy Spirit to invite Timothy on his team, he knew what Timothy's reputation was from those that, that knew him. So Paul knew about Timothy and Timothy came to know much about Paul, kind of harkens back to the Sunday school lesson we had in here this morning, a little bit about mentorship and, and preachers training preachers, different context here. Now, what did Timothy know about Paul? Uh, Paul wrote to him in his second epistle, 2 Timothy, chapter 3 and verse 10, but thou hast fully known Timothy, my son in the faith, the one that I've, I've spiritually mentored. Thou hast fully known all these things about me, my doctrine. Well, hopefully he would know that, listening to Paul preach over and over again. Uh, his manner of life. Paul didn't just show up, preach, and run away and do things in secret. They living together, talking together, cooking together, and all those things. Manner of life, his purpose, his faith, his long-suffering, his charity, his patience. And it goes on to talk about some of the things, negative things, circumstances that uh, Paul went through that Timothy understood. So... Paul knew about Timothy from his reputation. Timothy knew about Paul, probably initially from, about his, by his reputation, but then being mentored by him, being trained by him. So what did this uh, church in Thessalonica know about Paul and Timothy? And we'll throw Silas in there because he was part of the evangelistic team as they rolled into uh, this city in, in Macedonia. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5, where we were last, uh, last Wednesday, we read, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, and this should ring familiar to those that were, were here in our last midweek service and here listening to the preaching. Uh, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know, ye, all y'all, you saints, people in the church there in Thessalonica, 
as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And we're going to come back to that. That's going to be our, our key focus tonight. Uh, this thought, that would be the title, What Manner of Men, uh, from the latter part of verse 5 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, what manner of men, and this thought, ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So we're going to start off like we did Wednesday night. We're going to go to the book of Acts, chapter 17, and look at the beginning of this church, the historical account of them rolling into Thessalonica, and then we'll go and read again the, the first chapter of this first uh, epistle that Paul wrote to the Thessalonica, uh, Thessalonians. And Wednesday, some of you may have gotten frustrated because I was trying to draw a map in my head and your head, and our heads might not have connected there. So I said, you know what? Wouldn't it make more sense to just put a map behind me? And then you can get a, a sense of the Macedonian vision, Macedonian call, and they went over to, let's see, uh, then they went over... I had it backwards. And they went over. You just look at the map. Ignore me. Uh, to Philippi. And then when, after they got thrown in prison and got chased out of Philippi, they went down to Berea. Can you see that on the map? Going south out of Philippi. Or no, Thessalonica. Sorry, I skipped. The, that's our whole tech context tonight. Our whole thought is the church in Thessalonica. I uh, know. So, so they go out of Philippi to Thessalonica. Then they go down to Berea. And then Paul got chased out of there, not by the Bereans, but by the, the Thessalonians that rejected the gospel. So again, they chased him out of Thessalonica and went down to Berea, chased him out of there. He goes off to Athens, preaches at Mars Hill. And then from Athens goes to, can you see it up there? Corinth. And I didn't add extra graphics because I wanted more time just studying the word as opposed to taking an extra half hour to make one little arrow to show it. the letter that he was writing going back to the, the church in Thessalonica from Corinth. So in your mind, you can, you can put that in. You can put a little arrow, a little air, it wouldn't have been air mail, it would have been snail mail, and have a little snail and have a picture of a letter on it, the snail's back, and the snail going from Corinth back up to Thessalonica. Okay, so that's... That's where we are that I, I tried to explain Wednesday night. Now you, now you can see it. Now you can go, ah, why didn't you do that Wednesday? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe next coming Wednesday we'll be back uh, thinking about the, uh, some other aspect of the church in Thessalonica. So chapter 17, uh, I only read a few, uh, three or four verses Wednesday night. We'll read the first ten verses uh, tonight. Acts chapter 17. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed. And consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. And I wanted to, I think Wednesday, we just wanted to stop there on a happy note. We're going to continue to read about those that, that fought back. But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Amen and amen and hallelujah. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. All right, let's turn over to the letter now. So Thessalonica, they left there, they went to Berea, gets chased to Athens, goes to Corinth. From Corinth now writes this letter that we're going to start at the beginning of back to the Thessalonians. And this, as all the commentators would, would tell us, is likely the oldest of the letters we have in the New Testament, the, the, the Pauline epistles, the first one that um, Paul wrote here. 
So, uh, we'll read, uh, we read 10 verses there in Acts chapter 17. We'll read these 10 verses, which uh, correlate to the uh, whole of chapter 1. Paul and Silvanus and, and Timotheus, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll just reiterate, do a little uh, teaching by repetition. Uh, grace and peace, are those just cast off words that you put at the beginning of a letter, just like, dear John, dear Peter, Paul, Mary, dear whoever, uh, even if they're not dear, or was it, this is the city where the ones that rejected the gospel formed an a awful, mo- they got all the dregs of society and formed together a mob and chased them out of town and then chased them out of the next town. So Paul got to leave, but the Thessalonians are still there, the ones that believed, and they still live in the town with an angry mob that chased the evangelists out of town. So when he writes back, he says, you need some grace to live there with that angry mob in town. You, in the midst of that turmoil, need some peace. So grace and peace, again, are not just, oh, it's just part of the salutation. We just read that to get to the next part of the letter. That's important. Anyone here tonight need grace and peace? Amen. Now we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For, and this is where we were uh, Wednesday night, the beginning of verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, and we made the point, and, or maybe several sub-points, we do have to open our mouth, right? We, it came in word. That's, that's us. That's preachers. Beautiful feet and, and open mouths speaking the, the gospel. Uh, but not word only. But it did come in word. Uh, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. And we kind of stopped there uh, Wednesday, and so I wanted to pick up here tonight. As ye know... Ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples. What's the Greek word there, Brother Hopper? Tupos. Tupos. What does that mean? It's like a, it's like a die. It's like being stamped in. You know who taught me that? Brother Hopper, that's why I knew he knew. <laughs> uh, amen. So that the, ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia, so look at the map up to the north, and Achaia uh, down towards uh, the south. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven. Uh, That thought of waiting for the Lord, the Lord's return, uh, the rapture, uh, comes up in every single chapter in in this epistle, typically at at the end of each, each chapter. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us, from the wrath to come. Uh, And again, our focus is going to be on the latter part of of verse 5 there. Ongoing evangelism. So not necessarily just a chance crossing of you as a stranger to another stranger that you meet for an instant, maybe you give a track and you never see again. Might be a little, uh, little different set of circumstances, but some sort of ongoing evangelism. Uh, Cedro Woolley, where we're working with uh, some of the same people that are coming each week, or maybe visitors will come a little bit and, and then not see them. And, uh, so that's kind of an ongoing work of evangelism for the, one, the visitors that come that, that need salvation. Your neighbors, the co-workers, the, the ones you um, see on a somewhat regular basis. On, so that's what I mean by ongoing evangelism. Uh, that reveals to the evangelized the manner or manners of the evangelists, which are you and me. And hopefully I didn't say so many words that the thought got lost. The ones you continue to witness to 
are going to know about you. Just like he said, he's writing this letter, you, you know what you knew, what you know now what manner of men we were when we were with you, uh, giving you the gospel. And the ones that you are witnessing to and evangelizing or thinking you're going to, if you haven't opened your mouth yet and, and spoken in, in your neighbor, again, your neighbors, those you do commerce with, the next time I go into such and such store and I see that certain cashier, that certain whatever, the ongoing evangelism, the ones, the targets of your evangelism, they know some things about you. That's it sounded so much more profound in my head when I was meditating on that. Are you, are you with me? Okay. We're, we're challenged by the implication and the applications of God's omniscience, Him knowing everything about us. That's how we started the intro. Uh, but perhaps we give too little meditation and application to how our outwardly manifest manners affect our, our witness. And so... You know, any message we would preach would be, here's what the Bible says, here's what happened, here's a principle, and then the application is, okay, what does that mean for me? So hopefully you're getting a sense of, what does that mean that people I'm witnessing to on an ongoing basis know about me, know, know me. They know if it's a neighbor, they maybe see me when I'm out doing a project outside the house and it doesn't go right. Amen. I know all of your projects go perfect and you just whistle while you work, uh, whether it's inside or, or out. Uh, so the outline, uh, oh, please, please don't give us three points that are alliterated. Okay, we won't. Tonight, just some observations with regards to what the church in Thessalonica knew about Paul and his team. And as you tuck away thoughts on what others know about you and how that affects your evangelistic effectiveness, we'll look at what the church in Thessalonica knew about Paul and his team. Again, the title, What Manner of Men? What Manner of Men? You know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And so I took that thought and I just said, what did they know about him? So I just went back to Acts when they rolled into town and started to read the history and said, okay, based on what we're reading here, what did they know about Paul and his team that Paul now writes back and says, you knew this about us. And so I came up with four observations, and we might, if, if I continue to study this as the Spirit would direct, we may pick this up in another message coming up. But the first thing I noticed is that they were uh, Spirit-directed. If you go back to verse 1 of, of Acts chapter 17, you know, I've read this, you've read this, you've heard this read plenty of times. Uh, let's take a, a few words here and, and uh, turn the light bulb on and have them kind of flash and stand out a little more. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. So those words, passed through, compared to came to. Why didn't they stop and, and hold revival meetings in Amphipolis? Uh, why didn't they stop and see if there were some people that needed the gospel? Certainly there were lost people in, in Apollonia as well, but they passed through uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia. And they came to Thessalonica, where was the synagogue of, of the Jews. And so what did they know about th this team and my first observation was simply that they were, were spirit-directed in looking at the difference between passing through and coming to. And uh, maybe this was part of their conversation when they got into town. Hey, good to see you all. Uh, where have you been? Well, we were up in, in Philippi and uh, then Thessalonica. Wow, let me tell you about that. Uh, but we just came through, you know, Amphipolis and just Apollonia up the road, and here we are. And again, you're looking at me like, yeah, so... They just passed through, but Thessalonica was a destination, which tells me the Holy Spirit was telling them when to pass through a city and when to stop and consider a place a destination where they were to do some evangelistic work. You know, because in Mark 16, 15, uh, the, the, the church is an institution, therefore by application us as a New Testament church, 
Uh, we're told to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And we would say, any individual church would say, uh, that's a tall order. All the world, every creature. Okay, we can't do that. Well, we do that through our, some of our partnerships, and, and we can't go, but other churches go, and they send men and teams and, and whatnot. But for us, how do we know when to pass through and when to come to a city? Pass through Amphipolis and Apollonia, and, and, and when are we coming to a Thessalonica for us? Well, the Holy Spirit of God. We absolutely, positively have to be directed by the Holy Spirit. It can't just be, let's put our heads together and say, I like this place. Well, I, don't, I like that place. Well, okay, let's take a vote. It's, it has to be the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's an observation we can make. Just as they're rolling into town, to roll into town, they pass through two cities between the last cities where they were uh, doing some evangelistic work. Um, and so the Holy Spirit uh, does a manifold evangelistic work in the application for us of Mark 16, 15. A separating, a sending, a stopping, a steering, and a selecting work. And we'll, we'll go through those. You said, oh, you told us there were no alliteration. No, no, just not in the main points of the message. But sub-points, we can alliterate all we want. So, uh, the separating, Acts chapter 13. Paul and uh, Barnabas, are, along with some other preachers, are ministering there at the church uh, in Antioch of, of Syria, right? And Holy Spirit, as they were, they were laboring and they were praying and seeking God's direction and God's wisdom, the Holy Spirit said, this is your team and does, did a separating work, right? Uh, separate unto me, uh, Barnabas and, uh, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have, I have called them. And my testimony would be there are times when this church has done certain things and gone certain places, and, and I've said, honey, I think we're going to be part of this, this next phase, this next team, this next Bible Baptist Church Oak Harbor sending someone to do something here. And the Holy Spirit said, no, separate unto me someone else in, in a different team. And all along, uh, the Holy Spirit does that. He does a separating work. He does a sending work there at the beginning of Acts chapter 13, verse 4. So... So they, uh, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, you know, let me go back to, to the separating. Do you think after this trip, the Holy Spirit might tell us to go back and do something in Fiji? I mean, he might not. I mean, we all have that kind of expectation. It's like, why would we send, is it 11 or 12? How many? Is it 12? 11? So close to a dozen. Who's the one that was supposed to be there so it would be 12? No. Um, I mean, we, we, we sent them and we're praying for them with an expectation not just of what they're doing while they're there on this trip, but what the Holy Spirit's going to do in a, in a separating fashion when they come back. And, and I'm excited to see, hear their testimonies and see if the Holy Spirit, even right now, is doing a separating work. So a separating, then ascending... Uh, so they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, uh, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to, to Cyprus. This was the, the first journey, Barnabas and Saul, Paul and Barnabas, as the journey went on. Uh, so the sending to include, the separating then the sending to include the, the timelines. Uh, the sending to include maybe kicking someone out of a nest that feels like the nest is comfortable. Uh, the sending, all aspects of the Holy Spirit sending. So separating, sending, stopping. Do we ever say, I want to go in here, and there's lost souls here, and the Holy Spirit says, no. Does that ever happen? Did it ever happen in the Bible? I'll make it easy. Yeah, so if it happened in the Bible, wouldn't that be a pattern for us as well? As we're supposed to go into all the world and every creature, as, uh, take the gospel to every creature, and that'd be hard, so we say, what about here? What about there? And sometimes the there is no and the here is yes, or the here is no and the there is yes. And sometimes it's passing through and sometimes it's coming to. And so he does a separating, ascending, and sometimes a stopping. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word. Interesting if you just stop there. And the sentence doesn't stop there, so uh, it'll make more sense forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. That's not the Asian continent. 
Uh, that's not the uh, subcontinent of Asia Minor. That's the Roman province of Asia, which is in the subcontinent of Asia Minor. Which maybe you can, maybe it says that on the map, if it shows enough of the other side. Now, after they were come to Mycenae, they essayed to go into Bithynia. But what did the Holy Spirit say? No. No. But the Spirit suffered them not. So the Spirit does separating, sending, stopping. Well, if he does stopping, hopefully he does some steering. Is not here, not there, not there. And then the Macedonian vision, the Macedonian call. Over here, over here. The steering. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. They, uh, there stood a man of Macedonia. This is Acts 16, verse 9. And prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. How big is Macedonia? I don't know how many square kilometers. I don't know how many square miles. It's, it's there. It's that big. Uh, is there more than one city in Macedonia? And you're looking at me like, I don't know. Uh, oh, that's not fair. They, they cropped out the word Macedonia. So I'm mic'd up. Okay. And I don't have a laser pointer. So Achaia... Macedonia, up there, okay? So is there multiple, are there multiple cities in Macedonia? Okay. So the call was to Macedonia. Where in Macedonia? Well, there's, there's, there's the steering. Go that way. Go to Macedonia. Come over here, this, this vision. This generalized steering. Go that way. South Pacific. That's pretty general. Fiji. Well, now we throw another, if you're following the updates, now we're throwing another country in there, which is, what is it? Tuvalu. Tuvalu. So, South Pacific, Fiji, and this other country now, we'll see what happens with the Holy Spirit directing us there. But then within Fiji, how many islands are in Fiji? I don't know, a whole bunch. And you just take the main island, and there's the one side where the international airport is, and then the other side, and uh, then there's narrowing it down, narrowing it down, narrowing it down. Uh, Pacific Harbor and Navua. So there's the stopping, don't go here, don't go there. The steering, go over there, then the selecting within the, the steering. Um, a city within a region. Cities on Highway 20. Uh, we, were, we were steered to Highway 20, and then on Highway 20, the, the Holy Spirit did a further specific selecting of, of places. And as you recall, all the way at the other end. <laughs> uh, Holy Spirit, Langley's not far away. Holy Spirit, Clinton's not far away. Holy Spirit, Twisp is really far away. <laughs> and uh, places over there. So separating, sending, stopping, steering, and, and selecting. Who's doing all that? Holy Spirit. Doesn't man just say, a missionary came, and I cried when he did a slideshow, and I feel called to that country, and now I'm just going. Uh, that's more traditional, traditional uh, missions, which uh, often veers away from the principles of the Word of God. Uh, just uh, one individual self-separating, self-sending, self-steering, and then gets uh, a church to say, yeah, the Holy Spirit must be telling you to do that, go. And uh, questionable where the Holy Spirit's fitting into all that. Uh, but for our evangelistic labors as a church, we, we must, we must, we must be Spirit-directed. And that's the first thing I noticed in the beginning of uh, the history of this team rolling into the town. They passed through two other towns right before they came to Thessalonica. They were spirit-directed. Uh, Next, I noticed, just continuing to read verse 1 and uh, on into verse 2, they were spirit-directed. This, the Thessalonians knew about Paul and his team, and also that they were heart-driven. Kind of interesting when we referenced <laughs> Jeremiah 17, 9 before. We might develop that a little further in a coming message. But heart-driven, I mean, uh, I mean that by this. They came to Thessalonica 
where was a blank of the blank, a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Who's the them? The people that were in the synagogue, the Jews, Paul's, Paul's people. Was Paul passionate about saving Jews? A little bit or a lot bit? Well, I used the word passionate, so that's probably, you can't say, that'd be an oxymoron. A little passionate. Very passionate. Uh, we get to this section in his, his letter to the uh, church in, or churches in Rome, uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11, and it's uh, very instructive uh, about the Jews and Gentiles as well, but it, it, it sure shows us Paul's heart towards the Jews. The beginning of chapter 9 of the book of Romans, I say the truth in Christ, and, and I'm saying this not to stray away from the church in Thessalonica, but the first thing he did when he rolled into town was to go in the synagogue and preach to the Jews. So I'm showing some things, just making observations of him writing them saying, you knew what manner of men we were among you. They knew that they were a, spirit, a spirit-directed team, and they knew that they were heart-driven. Paul's passion to see all the lost saved, but especially the Jews. I say that this is the beginning of Romans chapter 9. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom are concerning the flesh, uh, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. At the beginning of chapter 10, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is this, that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Why do you think he kept going into synagogues everywhere? Because they were zealous, they were religious, but they didn't have knowledge, and he wanted to give them that knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that, that believeth. So he kept going, he had this heart for the Jews, he rolls into Thessalonica, and, he, and they knew, or just, he wrote and said, you knew, you knew these things about us. You knew what manner of men we were. You knew that just us coming there was directed by the Holy Spirit. And the fact that we immediately went into the synagogue and started to preach to the Jews, you saw that I had a burden in a heart. So they were spirit-directed and, and heart-driven, even though Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Romans eleven thirteen. Uh, they started off uh, the first missionary journey, uh, Antioch of Pisidia, again, Acts chapter 13, separated since, stopped, steered. Well, actually, the stopping and, and the steering comes on a different journey. On that first journey, uh, they go to Cyprus uh, from east to west. They go up to uh, the southern coast of Asia Minor, and they head up, they get to Antioch and Pisidia, uh, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of other everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So he, he explicitly said in his letter to the Romans that he is uh, the apostle to the Gentiles, we read historically of him going and preaching to Jews and them rejecting him and him saying, okay, we, we were uh, demanded, commanded to first give you the, the gospel. You're rejecting it, so we're going we're gonna to take it to the, the Gentiles. And yet, understanding God's specific call on his life to reach Gentiles, Paul still had this beating heart, this driven heart to take the gospel to the Jews every opportunity he had. And you've got to believe... You don't have to believe. I believe 
that when he writes to them in Thessalonica and says, ye know what manner of men we were among you, that's one of the things they knew. They knew that they arrived there because of the Holy Spirit of God directing them there, and they understood that he immediately went into the synagogue and preached to his people, the Jews, because his, his heart was just so strong for his people to be saved. So it's interesting, when he was in Antioch of Pisidia, that there was this transition of, we're supposed to take the, the gospel to the Jews, but now God has called me to be an apostle to the Gentiles. They leave there, and it's interesting what happens at the beginning of chapter 14. It came to pass in Iconium uh, that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. And so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. And so he never lost this, his heart uh, for his, his people, even though God specifically told him, that's not your primary mission field. Uh, and I, I meditated on, on, on how to draw some applications of that, or at least one application before we go on to the next thing that we can observe from scriptures that the church in Thessalonica knew about uh, what manner of men they, they were. Uh, this being heart-driven for you know, your own, own people. Uh, sometimes we can have maybe just shy of Paul's passions. He, he talked about being accursed of Christ uh, if he could see some of his, his kinsmen, his, his Jews, saved. Maybe we don't get that far. Maybe we still have a, a burning passion for those in our lives we would call our kinsfolk, maybe really our, our family members. And sometimes it's so much so that we, we want to move cross-country to, to be near lost, lost family or something like that. And I think one application might be here from Paul's life is that even though he continually took every opportunity... Uh, to reach uh, the, the Jews, those that were closest to, to his heart. Uh, God still had a different plan for him, primarily now to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And uh, I, don't, I don't know how that would apply to, to anyone other than just uh, maybe tuck that away in your heart, that sometimes the, the driving heart that we have, the passion to reach our people, whoever that might be, it might not be what God primarily has for you in your life. But it doesn't mean when the opportunities present themselves that you can't, like Paul, hey, let's go into the, there's a bunch of Jews going into the synagogue. Let's go in and see if they'll let us preach. Now let's move on to the next one. So spirit-directed, heart-driven, gospel-focused. What's the gospel? Have we heard about that at all today? 1 Thessalonians chapter 15 beginning at verse 1 and continue, really just go all the way to the end of the chapter. You might as well, but uh, we know primarily as Brother Josh was used to the Lord to preach this, this morning, a message on the gospel. Uh, they were gospel focused and we see uh, what was preached this morning in First, first Corinthians 15, verses 1 through wherever we went, uh, really lines up with Acts chapter 17 and verse 3 here. He okay, opened up the scriptures, opening and, and alleging and as we might recall from Wednesday night, that alleging is not placing a question mark over it. It's not, here's the gospel, allegedly. No, the alleging here is speaking with authority and confidence. Opening and alleging, speaking confidently that, that Christ must needs have suffered. That's the, again, this, this morning, the, the, the first point. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Christ must, must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is, is Christ. Why must needs have Christ suffered? Why did Christ have to die? It's a good question when you're, when you're evangelizing, when you're, when you're speaking to someone and sharing, sharing the gospel because it gets to the heart of man's problem. Sin. Uh, that Christ must needs have suffered. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 21. I don't have it cut and pasted, but I'll prove to myself it's still in my Bible. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
That really states the answer to the question, why must needs have Christ suffered? Gets to the heart of man's problem, sin. Why must needs have Christ... uh, Why must he have, uh, have raised from the dead? Well, that was preached this morning as well. Part of the gospel. And that he rose up from the grave. Why? Why did he have to? Well, it gets to the... The hope of God's promise, eternal life, salvation, something beyond the grave. You don't just live a good life, die, and hope for the best. Uh, Christ triumphed over uh, death in the grave, the, the end of the resurrection chapter, the end of, of 1 Corinthians 15, as opposed to starting with a, a very succinct definition of, of the gospel. And I have uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 referenced in my, my notes. Following Christ. Coming up out of the grave, uh, following his resurrection to walk in newness of, of life. And again, because much of that was preached this morning, we'll just acknowledge from Acts 17 and verse 3, they knew what manner of men they were. They were spirit-directed, they were heart-driven, they were gospel-focused. That was their message. The next one, and this might be my last one. How can it be my last one? We're having so much, so much fun. They knew that Paul and his team were physically industrious. Uh, Where do you find that? Well, uh, I don't know if this is cheating. It's just looking at uh, both of his letters written to this this church and reading through Acts chapter 17 from when they got to town and and when they left and and reading the letters back to them and and, uh, uh, later in in the second letter, Paul saying, here's some other things you knew. So at the beginning of, of the first letter, he says, ye knew... You know, excuse me, you know, present tense, what manner of men we were among you. And then you keep reading the letters and he references some other things. You remember this? Remember this? Here's something else that you know now about what manner of men we were among you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 to 13, that they were simply willing to work. They were physically industrious. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves... From every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. Uh, verse 7, chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, that's speaking of uh, positional authority, privilege. Not because we had not, you know, God telling us that you uh, preach the gospel, you live of the gospel. Not that it's wrong that you would feed us because we came and uh, uh, ministered to you in spiritual things. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample. Ah, there's that word again. And then sample unto you, imprinting ourselves upon you um, to follow us. Verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he... You can say it. It's okay. Eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. What does disorderly mean? Well, he tells us, working not at all but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in in well-doing. And this might seem just so simple and straightforward, but I, I just asked the question. He said they knew things about them. What things did they know about them from them being in their town, living amongst them for... Uh, this season of time, and these are that is one of the things that they saw. They were simply hard workers. Uh, the behaving of themselves, not behaving of themselves disorderly, was defined as uh, the disorderly being uh, working not at all and being busybodies. And in the positive, uh, they wrought with labor and travail night and day. Work, eat, and be not weary. Is there anything else you think that they learned about what manner of men Paul and his team was that we can glean from the first and second letter that was written to them? Anything else at all? 
I see some no's and I see some yeses. I don't know, I haven't continued to study it. And we'll see if we pick this up later. But for tonight, we're going to draw this to a conclusion just with those four observations. Spirit-directed, heart-driven, gospel-focused, and physically industrious. If you look at those, really we can summarize that they knew something about all three aspects of their tripartite nature. Body, soul, and spirit. Body, they knew they were physically industrious, just the physical laboring. Their soul, they knew Paul especially was heart-driven for lost souls. That was his passion, his feeling, his thoughts. He couldn't get it out of his mind, out of his heart, out of his soul. And spirit, they were spirit-directed in everything they did before they ever got to Thessalonica. They passed through two cities to come to Thessalonica to minister there and and preach there. They were spirit-directed in all aspects of evangelism. And at the end of his first letter in in, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 23, Paul now prays a prayer for them at the closing of, of that first epistle about their tripartite nature. He starts off the letter, the end of verse 5 of chapter 1, saying, ye knew these things about us, and they covered body, soul, and spirit. Then he comes to the close of the letter, and he says, now I'm going to pray for your body, soul, and spirit. In verse 23 of chapter 5, he says, and the very God of peace, starts with peace, ends with peace, the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, you'll see that at the the Lord's return at the end of chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and and here, chapter 5. Well, what was the consequence of them seeing these things about the body, soul, and spirit of Paul and and his team? Well, they became followers of them. Um, Ye became... Don't worry, this isn't going off into a separate message. This is just part of the conclusion here. Just the consequence of them, okay, so they knew some things about Paul and Silas and Timothy, and maybe Dr. Luke was with them. They knew some things about him. Well, because they knew those things about him, they became followers of them. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. And then it continues on, we we read that at the beginning. That they then, so Paul and his team imprinted themselves upon those that believed in Thessalonica. They then went out and and imprinted themselves as in samples to those in Macedonia and Achaia and everywhere else. They became followers of Paul and his team, uh, consorting with them, hanging out with them, spending time with them, fellowshipping with them, associating with them. They became... And more importantly, followers of the Lord. That's why Paul would you know, write to the, the church in Corinth later on, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be followers of me even as I also am of, of Christ. Um, and there's this, this little phrase at the end of verse 5. Uh, as ye know what manner of men we were among you. This is back in chapter 1. What's that, that last phrase, those last three words? Four. Sorry, I went back there and, and you didn't. I gave, didn't give you time. Actually, two thoughts. Uh, you know what manner of men we were. Really, two phrases put together. Among you, hard for people to know about you if you're not among them. Amen. And then that last little phrase, for your sake. For your sake. That's our whole purpose of being there. It wasn't for us, it was for you. Uh, So what manner of of persons ought ye to be? And I'm not just getting politically correct there. Uh, That's Peter's phrasing. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of of God? So we're to be holy and and godly and uh, spirit-directed, heart-driven, gospel-focused, and physically industrious. And expecting, expecting, looking for the Lord's return. So I end with a simple question. Uh, What manner of men 
Uh, what manner of women? What manner of children? Uh, just what are your manners um, to the evangelized? Those that you're trying to reach. What do they know about you? It's noted with Paul and his team. I think it should be noted for us. 